thank you to everyone who's joined us this morning for this webinar um, with the wonderful Peter Hillary. Apologies about the slight tech issues to start off with, but we're more or less sorted now. Um, just wanted to, yeah, to thank you for joining CARES webinars, um, our world-class speaker series. The aim of this series really is to share insights and advice from our world-class community. So CARES world-class community is a group of around 550 global Kiwi who are changing and shaping the industries that they work in, raising New Zealand's profile on the world stage, and most importantly, giving back to their community. So our world class member this morning, as I've said, is Peter. Welcome, Peter. Thank you so much for joining us, despite the tech issues. Oh, well, tech issues, those little challenges. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> Um, so Peter, I just like we'll just dive straight into it, I think. And I'd just like to kick off and ask you, you're obviously from a mountaineering family, but what was it that first got you, you know, what was it that first got you interested? People don't necessarily do what their parents do. Well, I guess that's true, but I, I guess the fact that I'm down here in the South Island about to go skiing, and of course I'm wearing my, you know, my <laughs> snow crystal all over. I just love being in the mountains. And I think, you know, it's not really surprising to people when you meet um, someone who is brought up on a farm and you find out that they're farmers or they work in the agricultural industry or someone who comes from a, a medical family. Um, they you, you find a lot of medical people end up um, becoming doctors and nurses or, or managing health and, and, and that sort of area. I think in a way you, you feel comfortable in that particular area. But in any event, I was the sort of kid who just loved the excitement, the camaraderie of heading into the mountains. And my father gave me so many opportunities to do it, or both my parents did. And um, I guess I've been going there ever since. Amazing. And what have some of your highlights been to date in your very long and varied mountaineering career? Well, I've been on over 50 expeditions to mountain regions around the world, particularly Antarctica and the Himalayas. Um, but look, I think, you know, some of my favourite trips have been in the Southern Alps. They're short sorties into the mountains, you know, maybe two or three days Um one climbing partner, you've got a particular objective. Um, and it's it's not that, that it's, you know, be, because the Southern Alps is, um, you know, New Zealand's great mountain range. It's not just that. It's, it's that they're, they're short and enjoyable trips because major expeditions, they are actually, they're hard, they're boring, they go on forever. You're waiting to acclimatise, you're waiting for the weather systems. You're in a very remote place very often. Um, so yeah, look, I, I think some of our homegrown adventures up in the Mount Cook sort of uh, Alpine area are some of my best memories of mountaineering. Amazing. And you've obviously continued your father's legacy in, in many ways through your work with Himalayan Trust, also obviously summiting Everest. Um, you've, as you said, you've done a lot of work in Antarctica. But how difficult has it been to to continue that legacy of your father's, which is also obviously quite important to you, but also kind of do your own thing, make your own name for yourself. Yeah, look, I think you have to go through a process of sort of analysing that and working out how you fit into things. But I think one of the revelations I had along the way is why do we always have to be, um, you know, people sort of go, but you're only follow, you're in your father's shadow. And I, I guess... I've come back and said, well, no, I don't see myself as in the shadow. I see myself as being in the light of this rather extraordinary person who I was able to grow up with, go on expeditions with, work with on, on fundraisers and various events for the schools and hospitals in Nepal. You know, I think this, this idea of being in the shadow is very negative. Um, so, I, look, I see my upbringing um, and all the opportunities that came through it uh, with my father, Ed Hillary, was really being in the light, be, being in his company. And that was a very positive thing. And I, I guess philosophically, this is, an, an, for, for me at least, 
has been an important way of of dealing with having a very famous and influential father. Um, you know, actually, it, it's it's okay. It's okay to be his son, to carry on doing a lot of those things, and and not being you know a a major shining star out there on your own because that doesn't always have to happen. And was that was that something you discussed with your dad? The parts of you know his work that you were keen to follow on, and he was keen for you to take on versus the things you perhaps like your expedition to, you know, charting a new course to the South Pole, the things that you perhaps went off and did by yourself. Yeah. Oh, look, uh, you know, a, a bit like I think the conversations with my father's father and him and, and my father and me, I've, um, we, we've, we've all done that. I mean, Dad suggested I might like to become an engineer or something like that. And I, I sort of started heading down the science route at university, but I kept looking back at him and thinking, I'd like to do what you do and go on expeditions. And I'd already gone on a lot of his expeditions. And um, so I guess that's the direction I took, going on mountaineering expeditions, organizing them, getting them funded. Um, and that, be that became my life. And out of that, obviously, lots of you know, other areas you had to develop, such as making films, writing books, giving speeches, all these sorts of and what is, what is kind of the preparation and the work like when you are setting up an expedition? Because I think that's something that a lot of people wouldn't necessarily understand because, I mean, I've never really thought about what goes into an expedition. Well, there's, there really is quite a lot to it, particularly if you're going into a place like the Himalayas, for example, you've got to get a peak permit and pay fees and fill out all these different forms. Of course, insurance is generally not a very big part of the um, of the requirements because no one will give you any. So that clears that one up nice and, nice and simply. Um, but you, you've got to raise funds, obviously. You've got to get sponsorship um, because you're going to be away for generally three months. It's a very long process to acclimatize to the high elevations. Um, so you have to make applications, maybe a book contract, maybe trying to create some news videos um, or, or even a documentary film. So there, there are many, many layers that, that are involved. And of course, while all of this is going on, you've got to be training. You've got to make sure that you're in a very good cardiovascular state of fitness um, if you're doing technical rock climbing on, on a particular climb, you need to be out there doing lots of rock climbing so that you're fit. And most importantly, your mind is attuned to that type of thinking, that sort of strategic approach to your mountaineering. So there's a lot of preparation. But in a way, if you're in a succession of mountaineering expeditions, you're really going from one to the other and it never stops. Well, and what are what are some of your most memorable expeditions? Look, I think you know, obviously, one of the most memorable was the first time I climbed Mount Everest many years ago, back in 1990. And um, you know, I'd heard the stories of Dad and Tenzin getting up there, and of course, the the uncertainty. And the uncertainty was, you know, is our human physiology actually capable? of climbing a mountain up there at 29,000 feet, nearly nine kilometers in the air. And there was a lot of uncertainty about that. You know, during the war, aircraft had lost pressurization and of course everyone had died on board. And uh, they're going, will we remain conscious? And of course they showed that through acclimatization over a long period that you may be lightheaded, but you do retain uh, your consciousness. Um, they also showed that they they had the wherewithal to climb the technical difficulties of that summit ridge. So it was, you know, it's an important time. And for me to be up there, experience it myself was this marvelous insight into the stories that I'd heard. It was very, very special, powerful, powerful experience. How long does it take to to get to the summit? Or well, how long did it take you? I should say. 
Well, typically, um, Mount Everest expeditions are getting a little shorter now because they've got, you know, a lot of the sort of logistics, um, you know, very well developed. But Mount Everest expeditions take two to three months to climb the mountain. The actual climb only takes a few days, um, but it's the need to go slowly up to the base camp, which takes a couple of weeks because of the altitude, and then another five or six weeks to acclimatize to the 8,000 meter level, which is called the death zone. And this is a very slow process. You just have to be there. You have to do the time. Amazing. And have you ever had any expeditions where things have not quite gone the way that they were planned? I think on every expedition, things don't go according to plan. And look, I, I'm sure a lot of uh, the Kia membership, I'm sure all of them will relate to that because nothing ever goes completely according to plan. You 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 make all the best plans, you do the best preparations, and then things change. And certainly in mountaineering, it's like that. It is in business, it is in life, uh, raising a family. Um, you prepare as best you can, and you have to deal with whatever comes along, like our technical issues getting on this line. But we got there in the end. And, um, you know, I mean, that's that's sort of the way it goes. I mean, obviously, on mountaineering expeditions, things can be pretty serious. And that's part of the attraction of it, that you're managing a situation that has very, very serious outcomes if things go bad. And those have to be a part of your thinking and of your preparation. Uh, and certainly, I've, I've had that. I was on one expedition on a beautiful peak, sort of the Matterhorn of the Himalayas, and being the Himalayas, of course, twice the height of the Matterhorn, um, this gorgeous looking peak, we got hit by an avalanche, great blocks of ice coming down on us. Um, and I was very lucky to get out of there three days uh, of abseiling down ropes that we would lower down. Uh, I had a broken arm and a number of other injuries, pretty agonizing over three days, sitting on tiny ledges. And, you know, all of a sudden, you're not focused on the top, you're focused on getting out of there alive. Um, but you've got to continue using your self-discipline, the skills that you have uh, on a very steep, difficult and dangerous mountain to get yourself out of there. And um, so the focus is simply all the time, just on the next step. And I think it brings up a, an interesting area. You know, it's not like, you're going, I just want to get down off this mountain in one piece, because that starts, you can see it's going to take days. You're in agony. You've got to break it down into tiny steps. You just want to get down another three meters to a little ripple in the rock where you can get your crampon boots partially onto it for a little bit of purchase. That's your objective. And you accomplish that, and then you set another small step goal and really I think a lot of things in life are like that. Awesome and I want to um, pick up on that a little bit now because I know you've mentioned you know kind of lessons for business and lessons for life and I, I know a lot of your uh, talks around the world do tend to fall into that category but what are sort of the key lessons from mountaineering that you know have really taught you things about business and about life and that people that perhaps like myself probably aren't going to scale Everest in my lifetime can sort of take and learn from? Look, I think, you know, firstly, one of the things is all of these different things that we do, um, you know, really are an important part of the matrix of empowerment that, that we all feel throughout the world for every single person. For example, you know, when my father and Tenzing made the first ascent of Mount Everest, suddenly they paved the way for that human possibility that every single person on the planet goes, we as collective humanity, we can climb Everest or we can land on the moon or we could go to Mars. You know, and I think now we live in this time where people go, well, look, I may not want to go and live on Mars. But I honestly believe that human beings one day will and, and that we could. 
And I think this was a big change that has happened over the last, you know, 50 to 100 years. And, and the climb of Mount Everest was one of those steps. All of a sudden, a mountain that many thought was unclimbable, it was too high or too difficult, you go, it, it really can be done. But in terms of sort of lessons from mountaineering, I think it's being prepared to manage risk, to enjoy risk, because actually, as much as we all spend our time trying to avoid high risk situations, you know, like when we drive our car, we, we're wanting to get from A to B, but we want to do it without um, actually experiencing high risk. The fact is, though, that risk does happen, and it's how we deal with it. And that's been an important aspect, I, I guess, one of the big lessons for me is thriving with risk, because actually risk is exciting. And when you think about business, um, you know, you're not going to end up being very successful unless you take a few risks. You come up with new technologies. You um, try to change the way we do things. There's a chance that your timing isn't right. There's a chance that your preparations and your technology isn't right. Um, but so risk is a big part of it. And I think we need to approach risk, um, you know, and see it really as exciting and, and inspiring. And it can bear amazing fruits. In the case of mountaineering, of course, it's that amazing sense of satisfaction that you've completed a, a new line up this magnificent mountain. It's a personal achievement that maybe is only fully appreciated by other mountaineers, um, but you know, nonetheless, is is something that that makes you feel very satisfied, and I think that's important. Amazing. And I want to talk a little bit now about your work with the Himalayan Foundation. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, about the work you're doing there and about what is it that, I guess, attracts you to the, to the people in that region? Well, look, it was all through friendship. Um, you know, my father was going on a succession of mountaineering expeditions, which obviously culminated in the first ascent of Mount Everest, and then he went on further expeditions. And he found he really enjoyed the company of the local ship of people living in very simple villages high in the Mount Everest area. And um, on one occasion, he, he asked if there was one thing he could do for them, what would it be? And there was uh, a, a very rapid answer to that. They wanted a school for their children. You know, it, it wasn't a raise in pay. It, it wasn't... Um, you know, a holiday in America, it, they wanted a school for their children. They, they saw that as the, the greatest thing that they could, they could do. And so Dad started answering these petitions, working with the local people, building schools, getting uh, Nepalese teachers to come up and help the kids get, get some literacy uh, and a general education. And, of course, this is something that we continue to this very day. And of course, um, you know, we're putting in computer laboratories, for example, um, because literacy on its own in the old sort of 19th, 20th century way of looking at it simply isn't just a pen and paper. These days, you, you've got to have technological literacy. So that's something that we're doing up there. And we um, really enjoy this process. There was a real connection um, between the people um, and my father. And this is something that we, we continue to this day. And I think it's one of the most satisfying things you can do. And look, any of your um, here members, and I'm sure most of them have families, I mean, really, that, that's what we do with our children. You know, we, we help them, we give them opportunities to fulfill their ambitions and develop themselves so that they can build wonderful lives. And it's important that we as community members, I think, reach out and do that in various ways. And so this is one of the ways that the, the Hillary family have, have done that. And we in New Zealand have, are very fortunate to have this special connection with the Mount Everest region. You know, we can't um, basically 
uh, influence everything around the world. It's a small country, small population, but to have this special relationship with the people of the Everest area, I think is an incredible privilege. And it's something that's gone on now for 70 years, because this is the 70th anniversary year of that first ascent of Mount Everest. And I, that's very uh, well segued of you, because that was what I wanted to talk about next, was the 70, <laughs> of, 70 years since your dad's climb, um, which when you say it like that, sounds like a really long time ago, but doesn't doesn't feel like that long ago. So what is it that you think has kind of kept it captivated people's imaginations about what your dad did to the point where it has you know it's still so relevant 70 years on what do you think it is that New Zealanders in particular identify with look I think for most people the whole idea of climbing a mountain you know if you get children to draw a mountain they draw this big sort of v-shaped um, peak and little people scrambling up. It's the whole idea of an endeavor. And, you know, in some ways, uh, Everest has entered the lexicon as, a, as, you know, a metaphor, you know, or um, a way of describing a challenge. What is your Everest? Um, you know, it's, it's sort of come in and people talk about this as an aspiration. And I think that's really quite an important part of it. So, all idea of climbing a great mountain, doing it in good style, in cooperation with the local people that you're working with, all of these things have become important ways. And, and in the way we think about challenges, they've become, you know, quite important metaphors. So um, I think it retains its, its relevance. And to the extent that because lots of people can attempt it now, um, it's really a rather wonderful way of individuals going off and having a huge adventure, which is still available to people today. And I can tell you that someone who goes on a Mount Everest expedition or any big mountain around the world in the European Alps and the Southern Alps in New Zealand or, or in the Himalayas, these sort of events, they, they change you forever. I mean, it's, it's, they're very powerful experiences. Look, I would say in a way, if someone does a, a master's degree, every day they wake up and, you know, I, I did a master's degree. But that's the way it is for someone who's climbed Everest or climbed a large mountain, um, you know, down in Antarctica. It's with you every day. You're a changed person by, by the power of that experience. And it's a rather wonderful thing. And how, how have you seen, and certainly I'm sure you had conversations with your dad about it, but how have things changed in mountaineering over the past 70 years? Because I imagine the way that your dad went about things and prepared and the equipment and the technology that they had is quite different to what we're seeing yeah. today. Oh, look, th things obviously have changed. But, you know, one of the interesting things here is that I think it's, you know, the important thing is that each generation has the best equipment and training and skill sets that they can possibly get for their day. And um, that's, the, that's the key. And back in 1953, they had the best gear, the best team, um, and, uh, you know, amazing logistics um, and, and actually experience for what was lying ahead. And obviously, as the years go by, we all climb on the shoulders of the people who went before. And that's a wonderful thing. It means we can go further, climb harder, do things better. And, of course, that is what um, the current generations of mountaineers are doing. They're, they've got better equipment. They have better skill sets. They're climbing ice that is far more technical than we could climb you know, um, 70 years ago, um, and they can do it more quickly, which enables them actually to, to do ascents that are really quite audacious in, in the terms of the 1950s or 60s or 70s. Um, and so it continues to develop, which is, um, for a mountaineer, very exciting to see. I mean, many people will have seen 
the film about the, the solo climber on El Capitan or some of the alpinists climbing very, very steep ice uh, in the Alps or, or down in the Andes of South America. They are pushing the parameters of what we thought was even possible um, to greater limits. And it does expand in many ways, the realm of human possibility. And I think that's very exciting. And I have great admiration for those practitioners who come along and continue to push the boundary. It didn't just stop with Hillary and Tenzing on Everest. It continues on. And that's the way it should be. Amazing. And I want to talk to you a little bit now. Um, shortly, we'll go to a, a Q&A session from the audience. So if you do have any questions for Peter, you can just type them in the Q&A box below on your screen. Um, but before we get to that, Peter, I want to talk a little bit about your next expedition or one of your next expeditions to Antarctica in March, um, which is a, a thought leadership expedition. So you, along with Sir Graham Henry um, and a couple of wonderful Australians, an Australian filmmaker and a, a thought leader uh, over there, uh, sort of taking a group of people to Antarctica to really experience I guess climate effects firsthand and bring people together to sort of share their ideas around how they're tackling that why is that a project that you were keen to get involved with what was it about about that trip that made you want to get on board well I guess First and foremost, I love going to Antarctica. It's one of the places I've been to 42 times um, on expeditions, but also working on ships. But look, the, the whole issue that we're all so involved in with climate change, with environmental degradation and impacts caused by humanity, these are incredibly important issues. And um, I, I feel this is a wonderful opportunity to take people down to a place that is still in the ice age. I mean, there are, I, there are issues of global warming, of course, in Antarctica, but Antarctica for a number of reasons is still gripped in the ice age. The continent is 98% covered in ice. That's a kilometer to five kilometers thick. It's quite extraordinary to go there, experience this, this place by immersing yourself in it, Seeing some of the challenges that the, the uh, change in environment, uh, the, the climate change is actually happening, have these conversations and actually search for more solutions about how we're going to deal with this because humanity has a role. We've um, accepted that we have created the Anthropocene. It's the age of humanity in, in geological terms, and it is having a very deep impact. And it certainly is uh, around climate. Um, and I've always found that people who go to Antarctica come away as advocates for the place um, and with a greater awareness of, um, of these big issues. And um, the idea is on our particular voyage, we really want to discuss what each of us can do and how we can work towards ameliorating the situation um, that we're moving into. And it's becoming more and more apparent that it's happening faster than we thought. And what do you think it is that it makes it so powerful of, of being able to have those conversations while you're, while you're in Antarctica? How is that more effective than kind of sitting on Zoom around the world having those conversations or having them in your living room or, you know, your country that has no ice. Oh, look, that's right. I mean, look, for all of us, you know, we all use video calls, you know, all the time, don't we? And I'm sure everyone will be in agreement that um, you're, you're sitting on a video call and there's all these little faces there Um Look, you've got important things to think about, but it's not a highly stimulating environment. Whereas if you're actually out on the decks of a ship or walk, walking on the shore um, amongst a, a, near a penguin colony with great icebergs floating by, um, all of a sudden things are very powerful. So it's a, a wonderful opportunity 
to go on on a voyage, on a journey um, to one of the most extraordinary parts of the world. It is in the Ice Age. Um, But to have these conversations and to explore what we need to do as humanity um, to reduce our impacts and and hopefully stall uh, the changes of climate change that are occurring. And because there are still some, there is still some availability for spots on that cruise. So what, or, or on the expedition, I should say. So what sort of, you know, people would you encourage to come along? Who are the people that would would benefit from this? Well, look, I think there are a lot of people for whom the idea of going to Antarctica is very attractive. I mean, this is on a very comfortable ship. It's like a, a floating hotel. Um, you know, small numbers of, of, of people um, with lots of opportunities to go ashore and really sample what it's like to be in Antarctica. Um, so the sorts of people are wide ranging. You know, you don't need to be a hardened expeditionary person at all. Anyone from any walk of life. And I've gone down there many times now. Uh, we've had people in all age groups um even some people with some mobility issues but i guess the key thing is to do with your motivations you know what you want to get out of it the experience of antarctica uh, a concern um, about where we're going environmentally and in terms of climate change and um you know a desire to participate in a conversation um, about what is happening um, with, with with climate and the environment and what are the options for dealing with it. Amazing. And as a mountaineer, how, and, you know, and someone who obviously thrives off the national uh, environment, how important is that topic of climate to you? Oh, look, I, I think climate is the most important thing, very closely connected to human population. So they're, they're difficult issues. Um, but really, if, if we have radical climate change, what this translates into, and I mean, there's the, the geological and hydrological records that sustain this, is that sea levels change. Sea levels change dramatically. It's not just one or two meters, it could be tens of meters. Um, And in fact, in the geological past, it has been 100 meters or more. And obviously, if these sorts of eventualities occur, then everything changes. You know, you're going to face um, the disintegration of political and um, security situations. So we need to manage our environment We need to manage ourselves and we need to learn about the different processes and be willing to change. Because in a way, that's one of the things I've reveled in in my mountaineering career. You go to a mountain because it's it's actually it's not just a static thing. It changes. The weather changes. The snow conditions change. And it's how you deal with it. Well, on a very macro level, this is what we need to do with our planet, with its climate, with the environment. And we need to learn how how to adjust to that um, and to manage it so so that we can ameliorate the impacts um, to a level that we can sustain. Amazing. Thank you. Um, I've got some questions here that have come through from some of the panellists. They're quite um, varied, so I'll just start from the top and, and work down. Uh, So the first one is, I love this topic of risk. How have you dealt with risk in your expeditions where others might not be as prepared or as excited by the idea of risk as you are? How do you lead others through this to encourage them? Well, I guess to answer that question about dealing with risk, you have to look at there's sort of two general types of expeditions that most people are probably aware of onto big mountains. You, you've got the expert expeditions where you've got maybe four climbers heading off together, all very experienced, wanting to do a, a new line on a mountain. And so this is a group typically with high motivation to get out there and do it and a lot of experience. 
Um, generally, they've, they've known each other or known some of the members of the expedition quite well. And then you've got guided expeditions. And guided expeditions, look, they're relevant too, but by nature, they, they tend to be a group of people who don't have um, you know, as much experience. That's why they're going on a guided expedition to be um, assisted um, in, in their ascent of a, a particular mountain and generally not doing as difficult to climb a, as a consequence. So, you know, those are, I guess, are, are differences and that is a difference in the actual risk profile. But risk is a very interesting area and it's just something that we'll talk a lot about um, when we're down in Antarctica, um, because managing risk is really about managing our lives and what we want to do. And, and it's important, too, because we don't want to be completely confined in um, what we get out there and do, because we're afraid of certain um, outcomes. And, of course, good preparation, um, understanding the environment that you're going to get yourself into. And I mean, you can say the same of the Antarctic expedition. You're going with uh, uh, an expert crew on a ship that's appropriate for it with people who have a lot of experience in it. And you go, well, I'm prepared to go to Antarctica, back to the Ice Age with this group. In a similar way, you know, you get on an airliner and we all trust that this is an airworthy aircraft built by a good company and it is it is run by very experienced flight deck crew and cabin crew. And you go, look, this, this is going to be all right. These are sort of assessments we make. And in a way, we're having to do that all of the time. It's, it's a management process, but it's a very exciting process too because it's about, in a way, in, enriching yourself and your confidence in what you can do. Amazing. Uh, thank you. Next question is, when did you experience the moment that brought you closest to death and what were your thoughts and emotions at that critical moment? I, I, I think my thoughts were, damn, that's a pity. <laughs> you know? um, you, and you, I mean, I just remember wondering, how am I going to get out of this one? But that's again, it's it's what it's like a challenge has been thrown down, and you go, well, you know, I've done a lot of this sort of situation and mountaineering. Um, there's basically a couple of things that I can do, and then you just focus on those. It's amazing; those situations suddenly strip away all the superfluous stuff that is not needed, and you just focus on the the absolute core basics to sort out the situation, to get yourself out of there. And thank you. And the third one, is it is it true that Alec Everest is relatively easy compared with other peaks? If I am a novice climber but reasonably fit, is it feasible for me to climb it? So. Yes, look, um, I'm hearing a lot of people say that. Um, technically, Mount Everest... Um, has only moderate technical difficulty, but you'd be very unwise, and I, I would counsel absolutely against going to it unless you had high technical competence. You had a lot of experience. And the reason is, is it's a long, hard expedition. You make a mistake and you're flying through the air for kilometers. You will not come home. Um, and the more technically competent you are, the more easily you can move efficiently in moderate technical terrain. Now, this all sort of sounds like a whole lot of words mashed together. Moderate technical terrain is basically a, like a 45 degree ice face, slick ice, that if you slip on, you will go forever and you will not survive. Um, but you need to be able to move on it with competence and confidence. And to do that, you have to learn how to really climb ice well. So I would encourage um, the person who asked that question, if they wanted to climb Everest, I think that's brilliant. Um, but do your apprenticeship. Like, do your apprenticeship in the way that you do an apprenticeship for everything, whether it's learning to drive a car as a kid, um, learning to run a, a new business, 
um, you know, whatever it is, you've got to learn your game. And so if you want to climb Everest, set yourself a goal in 10 years' time that you'll go on an Everest expedition. You'll go and do some moderate climbing in the Southern Alps of New Zealand. You'll go to the European Alps next year. Um, you might go to uh, do a climb in Antarctica the year after that. And over that decade of building up experience, improving your skill sets, um, you know, developing uh, great connections with a group of other like-minded climbers, um, you eventually start climbing in the Himalayas where you've got the added impediment of extreme altitude, hypoxia. Um, we're not the same person we are at sea level up there at 8,000 meters with still nearly 1,000 meters to go. Um, you need to have things locked into your system and know yourself and how to deal with the climb uh, before you get up there, that's for sure. So, um, yes, do your apprenticeship. Wise words. Uh, and just two final questions here. One is, what what are your biggest learnings from your time in mountaineering? What are the, the things that you would take away from it the most? Look, for me, I think it's really been, you know, the camaraderie. The um, You've got this amazing objective. You're working together with your team of, you know, maybe three other climbers, uh, wanting to achieve this a uh, climb up a you know a beautiful ridge line on a big mountain um yeah it's it's the time that you spend with people it's intensity incredible intensity and and funnily enough i think that's one of the reasons why so many mountaineers keep going back um quite often after a climb it could be in the southern alps it could be in the himalayas you you come down and go well that's great i'm, I'm glad i succeeded in getting up there but I'm never going up there again god I was I was so cold I was I was so scared you know it's such a long time I want to go home and then two weeks later you're on the phone to one of your climbing friends going what are we going to do next so it has a special quality and people tend to want to go back amazing and finally the last question I've got here is around are there any peaks or expeditions you haven't achieved or climbed or summited that you would like to is there anything that you oh, wish yes. you had done <laughs> oh i think there there are always climbs that you you didn't you didn't finally succeed in, in getting up or ones that you would have liked to have done but you you didn't um you're always going to have those in fact i'm a, i'm of the mind that if if you haven't got a few objectives when you come to the end of your life that you have not succeeded in then maybe you didn't have very many objectives and were not very ambitious in the first place. Um, but look, yeah, there, there, there are lots. And the more you do, the more you realise there is to do. But that's a wonderful thing. You know, it's, the planet is a big place. The mountain regions um, of the world are beautiful places because they've had really the least impact um, by humanity. And there are wild zones. And um, they're great places to go. It's, it's, it's no coincidence that many of the ascetics and the great philosophical thinkers went to the mountains to isolate themselves, to think and to contemplate um, before rejoining humanity again. And maybe in a way, um, that's what mountaineers like to do too. You know, we go away, we engage with a raw and hostile environment we challenge ourselves, we learn a little bit about ourselves, and we share that journey with a small group of people before we rejoin humanity again. And I think that's one of the draws. How many peaks have you summited through the course of your career? Oh, I don't know. There's lots of little peaks, like I climbed one little one last year in the winter. Look, I, I don't know. It's probably 100 mountains in different parts of the world. Are there any mountains you, you personally would have liked to have? have gone up but haven't yes no look i i do want to i'm 68 but i still want to do a few more peaks but what i'm focusing on now is climbing and going on um mount, mountaineering expeditions with my children my two sons 
and one of my daughters who's who's keen on these sorts of things. And I've really enjoyed that. There are advantages, of course, um, in climbing with your kids because you can go uh, to, you know, could you carry my pack, for example, <laughs> which, um, you know, <laughs> the kids are always better at doing. So, um, yeah, I want to, I'd like to go and climb Mount Aspiring again down in the Wanaka area um, with with um, the boys and maybe head up to Mount Cook as well. So a few plans still to come. Wow, so you're keeping that legacy rolling through into the next generation. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, thank you, Peter. That's all the questions that have been answered. Are there any sort of final words you'd like to leave people with before we wrap up for the morning? Well, look, I, you know, if some people would like to come and join us on, on the Antarctic voyage, I, I promise you, you will love Antarctica, an extraordinary experience. And the conversations um, we intend to have um, on board about the climate and the environment and, and being empowered to do something about it, I think are going to be very inspiring. So I hope people consider that. And I hope people can also consider the, the importance of risk in our lives and encouraging our young people to get out and take on risks. You know, it's not that we want them to get hurt, but we want them to manage risk because that's a big part of life. And it's a very exciting part of it, too. So um, in a managed and careful way, go out and be a risk taker. Amazing. Thank you very much for joining us this morning and for sharing all of your, your wisdom and insights. Um, I understand you've got a day of skiing planned, so all the best <laughs> for that. Um, and thank you to everyone that joined us on the call. Um, following this webinar, we will send out a recording so you can go back and you know listen again or pick up any of the parts that you missed. Uh, and I will also send out some details to uh, Peter Hillary's expedition to Antarctica for anyone that is interested. And there is a, a care package for members of our community um, who wish to take up that opportunity to head to Antarctica with Peter and, of course, rugby great Sir Graham Henry in March. So we'll leave it there. Um, thank you for joining us. And once again, Peter, thank you for your time. Pleasure. Thank you.